When it comes to making a hole in a part, the first tool most machinists reach for is a drill bit. Drill bits come in a bewildering array of shapes and sizes, and I'm just going to cover the most common variety so you can make informed decisions when choosing your tooling. Throughout, I'm going to be using the names and terminology found in tool catalogs in the United States. There will almost certainly be different terms used in various parts of the world, so please keep that in mind when shopping for tooling. First, let's talk about drill lengths. All machinists should be familiar with the two most common lengths of twist drills, jobber length and screw machine length. Jobber drills are by far the most commonly available type of drill bit. This is the kind of drill that you can find readily in your neighborhood hardware store. They're relatively long compared to their diameter, with a flute length approximately 8 to 9 times the diameter. This lets you drill deep holes, but it makes the drill quite flexible. This can lead to the drill wandering if you do not use a center punch or a spot drill first. Screw machine, or stub length drills, have flute lengths around half as long as a jobber drill of the same size, which makes them considerably more rigid. This can be useful since you can often get away without spot drilling first, which means fewer tool changes and shorter run times. Of course, for jobs where the hole location is critical, it's good practice to spot drill for every drilled hole. Screw machine drills are a great choice for drilling relatively shallow holes where the extra flute length of a jobber drill is not needed. They are also popular with owners of smaller machines because the jobber drill may not fit in the available space once you add up the height of the vise and the part and the length of a drill chuck. While these two types are the most common lengths available, there are a number of other options out there for drilling deeper holes or reaching inaccessible spots. There are also many different tip grinds available for twist drills, but by far the most common are the 118 degree chisel point, like this one, and the 135 degree split point. The degrees refer to the angle formed by the two cutting edges of the drill. While the 118 degree is a little more common, both types are generally available at industrial suppliers as well as hardware stores and home centers. The chisel point on the 118 degree tip is responsible for most of the walking problems encountered with drilling, especially when using a hand drill. Because of this, it is recommended that you always spot drill first when using these. 135 degree split point drills avoid this to a degree by relieving the drill on either side of the chisel point so the hole starts easier and with less pressure. This tip grind is recommended for drilling harder materials since the flatter angle of the tip results in shorter cutting edges and less friction. The type of shank is also a consideration. Straight shank bits are meant to be held in a drill chuck or a collet while taper shank drills are held directly in the lathe tailstock or the drill press spindle by the Morse taper shank. Straight shank bits are more common and considerably cheaper, but taper shank drills offer a very rigid way of holding drills of all sizes directly in the machine tool. Taper shank drills tend to be a lot longer than their straight shank counterparts. Adapter sleeves are available so you can hold different Morse taper sizes in your machine. There is a tang on the end of the taper to help remove the drill from the spindle or adapter sleeve. This is accomplished with a tapered drift by tapping it into the tang slot until the taper releases. A variation of the straight shank is the silver and deming bit, which is a large bit with a reduced shank. I prefer to hold this type of drill in a collet because it's much less likely to slip due to the greater contact on the shank. This ensures that the soft shank of the drill does not get scarred up, which makes it difficult to hold accurately in the future. Also, the capacity of a drill chuck refers to the size of the hole being drilled, not the shank size. Using a drill chuck to hold silver and deming bits, especially a keyless chuck that self-tightens, can damage the drill chuck. Drills are available for sale in different indexes or sets, and those sets are fractional, number, letter, and metric. 
The fractional index contains drills from a sixteenth of an inch to a half inch by sixty-fourths. Larger and smaller drills are available individually, with the larger drills generally being silver and Deming drills. Number drills, also called wire gauge drills, are actually sold in two different sets, numbers 1 through 60 and 61 through 80, with number 1 being the largest. Letter drills run from A to Z, with Z being the largest. The metric index contains drills from 1 mm to 13 mm in half mm increments. Like the fractional index, larger and smaller drills can be purchased individually, as can drills in finer increments than half a millimeter. There are several different materials used for manufacturing drills, with the most common being high-speed steel, cobalt, and tungsten carbide. High-speed steel drills are very common, cost-effective, and easily resharpened, but fall short when machining harder steels or materials that tend to work harden like stainless steel. Cobalt is a type of high-speed steel that contains between 5 and 8% cobalt to give it higher heat resistance. As such, cutting speeds, the SFM of the tool, can be increased by 10% over regular high-speed steel. Tungsten carbide is a much harder material and can cut its speeds at least 2 to 3 times higher than high-speed steel. Since it's harder, it's also more brittle and will chip very easily if dropped. Carbide drills are significantly more expensive than high-speed steel, but the cost is justified by the higher cutting speeds when machining harder steels, stainless, titanium, or exotic metals like Inconel or Monel. Drills are available in many different finishes and coatings that have an effect on cutting speed, tool life, and oil retention. Drills with a bright finish are just uncoated high-speed steel or carbide and are good for general purpose machining. Oxide coatings like black oxide or bronze oxide, you'll just have to take my word on this one, are available on high-speed steel and cobalt drills for added oil retention. Titanium nitride is a gold-colored coating that is regularly seen on cheap cutting tools sold in big box stores, so it's often seen as gimmicky, but it actually allows for a 25-30% to 30 faster cutting speed over an uncoated tool. There are several similar coatings that allow for even faster cutting speeds and feeds, and many of these are seen on end mills as well, such as titanium carbonitride, which is violet gray in color, titanium aluminum nitride, which is violet black, that is not for machining aluminum because it really likes to stick to it. Then there's zirconium nitride, which is very bright yellow in color, and this is an excellent choice for aluminum because aluminum doesn't want to stick to it for one reason or another. And it's got similar cutting characteristics to titanium nitride. It's important to note that you can buy any combination of these drill lengths, tip grinds, shanks, materials, or coatings in any of the different drill indexes. This means that there are a lot of possibilities out there. For general work, jobber length drills in each of the indexes will suffice. I find it very handy to have screw machine length sets in fractional and metric sizes with split points for quick jobs, since I can get away without spotting the hole first. Of course, the decision on which set to buy depends a lot on the type of work being done. Likewise, if a job comes up that requires a lot of holes in a difficult material, I'll buy a drill suited specifically to that job. There are two other types of drills that also deserve a mention, center drills and spot drills. Both can be used for spotting before drilling, but the center drill's main job is cutting a seat for the centers on a lathe. Center drills are sometimes called combined drill and countersinks in tool catalogs. They most often have a 60 degree angle on the tapered portion of the drill, but are also available with other angles like 82 and 90 degrees to fulfill their role as a countersink. Care should be taken when feeding center drills into the work since the small cylindrical tip is easily broken on the smaller sizes. You also need to be sure that you don't drill in past the end of the tapered portion to ensure that there is a good seat for the lathe centers. You should always stop about half to two-thirds of the way up the angle. Spot drills are usually short with a minimum of flute length so they don't flex although there are a variety of styles available, so it's difficult to generalize their shape. 
They are also available in many tip angles, but the most common is 90 degrees. This is useful because you can spot the hole deep enough that a chamfer is created before the finished hole is even drilled. This technique can eliminate a tool change and is especially useful when drilling and tapping holes. There are some things that every machinist should know about twist drills. They always make oversized holes, they generally leave a rough surface finish on the sides of the holes, and the holes they make are not necessarily straight in thicker material or round in thinner material. Most of these problems are caused by the fact that even the best quality drill bits have one cutting edge that is ground slightly more than the other, which causes a certain amount of wobble during the cut. You can see this in the chips created by the drill. One cutting edge contacts the material first and cuts more material, creating a wider chip on that side and a narrower chip on the other. This pushes the drill sideways, creating an oversized hole. The deeper a hole is, the more the drill will wander to one side, which can easily be seen on the lathe. Drill all the way through a piece that is as long as the drill flutes. The hole will be centered on the starting end, but it's usually offset considerably on the other end. In sheet metal, you'll have a different problem. The uneven cutting edge causes the drill to walk around a little bit. This gets worse as the tip of the drill starts to break through the other side before the full diameter of the drill gets into the material to stabilize it. This results in a hole with three lobes. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons down below. Feel free to leave a comment and ask me any questions that you might have. I'll try to get back to you. And thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.